Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here in Global Connections with Carlos Suarez, who joins us from San Antonio, Texas this time. And today we're gonna to talk about, uh, you know, the transformation, the coronavirus transformation. It has begun and it's becoming very clear. Hi, Carlos, nice to see you. Hello, Hache, good to say hello. I'm now on the mainland of the US, of course, but uh, as you well know, I've done another show or two in the past from San Antonio. This is a, a very Mexican town as well. Uh, and uh, very well connected to Mexico, a two hour short hop. So it's, and it's a, a beautiful throw. town. It's a yes, totally yes, beautiful. Perfect. I have friends that live there. They love yes, it. Yes, yes, uh, as well. So, uh, what, you know, what, what's on your mind first? We have the India trip and we mm -hmm. have the Trump reaction, uh, if you will, to uh, the coronavirus. Uh, where do you want to start? Yeah, maybe just uh, opening some quick remarks on the India. You know, uh, Donald Trump just uh, had a state visit uh, and, and, and had an opportunity to, in many ways, return the visit. Uh, I think it was a year and a half ago when uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Houston, Texas, and he was received there in a massive rally at a big stadium as well, and uh, almost uh, in a curious way, like a rock star. And now Trump returning there goes to this massive, uh, largest cricket stadium uh, in India, 100,000 people. And just, uh, you know, it must have been for him quite, you know, like another one of his rallies. It was quite exciting. They, you know, they even had, they were wearing 100,000 hats that said Namaste Trump on it. Uh, and uh, and so he, he meets with Modi and, and you know, nothing huge and substantive. I, I heard at the end that, well, there's a $5 billion dollar, dollar arms uh, sale. And I think, you know, it's $5 billion is a lot of money. But in terms of arms, it's really a drop in the bucket. I mean, uh, the, you know. But it was more symbolic. I think they're buying some helicopters. But, uh, you know, more to the point, I mean, these are two leaders, curiously, that uh, have established a very, uh, you know, sort of a, their own bromance. Uh, they're both uh, populist, uh, you know, strong national, hyper-nationalist leaders. Uh, you know, Modi's been in power uh, more years by now. But, you know, he's got, they share some common things, uh, particularly a very strong anti-Muslim sentiment. Uh, in the case of Modi, he's been pushing various policies, uh, a very controversial re re recent uh, 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 law that has allowing uh, refugees to become citizens, however, not uh, Muslims. Uh, oh, so all uh, the other you know, different, uh, and, and, and it's uh, reflecting, you know, again, his very strong nationalist. You know, he's a Hindu nationalist. Uh, uh, India is oh, about 82% Hindu, but the Muslim, you know, largest minority, uh, there's some 15% of the population. So it's the largest population of Muslims outside of, I think, Indonesia, the one exception. Uh, but uh, that aside, uh, I think, uh, you know, it just underscores how interesting, you know, leaders do develop these personal relations but on the one hand. There may not be a lot of substance going on between them because, you know, the U.S. and, and India, uh, while their relations have improved, there's not a great deal of, you know, trade and commerce. There's not a lot of military exchange, although we heard again this announcement of a brief uh, uh, or a, at least a modest amount of sales. Uh, but I think other than that, uh, you know, again, India is certainly as an important emerging power and as a buffer and balance uh, to India in that region. Uh, any U.S. president, you know, should be reaching out to somehow uh, yes. accommodate that. And, and then, again, the, the thing about India, while it may not have the hard power that we might see in Russia or China, it does have a very substantial soft power. Uh, and, and it has a very large diaspora community, both the U.S., the U.K., yeah. many, and, uh, and they play a very important role in helping promote uh, you know, India's image. Uh, so the, the soft power of, of, of India is interesting. And then it's always a paradox because here's, you know, the largest democracy uh, by any measure. It, it is a democratic society and yet mixed in with it violence. And even as Trump was there, there were, you know, a number of people who were killed in some uh, some of this, uh, you know, rioting and, 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 and did that have anything uh, to do with him? Did that have anything to do with not, his presence? Not, no, not not really. No, it was really again more protesting again uh, against. Well, I shouldn't say protesting. Most of the victims were Muslims. Most of those carrying out the crimes appear to have been these, you know, Hindu nationalists who support him. So uh, it, it has more to do with this recent controversial law that I've mentioned that that, that is now allowing refugees to become citizens. However, excluding Muslims, and so there's. You know, real tensions there. Uh, but I, I underscore because, again, it's this paradox of India. It's, it's a, it is the largest democracy, certainly, and yet it continues to have a fratricidal violence on a regular basis, usually Hindu-Muslim violence. And, of course, Modi himself has some baggage in his past. Before he was prime minister, he was the, you know, the, the, the first uh, uh, or the you know, chief minister for the state of Gujarat, uh, one of the most important states there in western uh, India. And in about 2003, I think it was, there was a massive, massive amount of violence. Uh, there was a, an incident that I think up to a thousand, uh, mostly Muslim, were killed. 
Uh, and his handling of that was very controversial. Many felt that he kind of fueled the flames and, and, and he took a lot of heat for it, but he was in fact able to come out ahead. And, and you know, again, given the solid majority of Hindus and many themselves who are firmly anti-Muslim, uh, elected him prime minister, re-elected him. So uh, yeah, is I guess he popular I, you know, now, I mean, Carlos? Is he popular now? Well, and did did the Trump visit help his popularity? Uh, I, I would say yes, in general. Again, partly because it's the theatrics. You know, he puts on a big show, and 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 by most measures, he is. He's a very popular, uh, you know, leader. Um, you know, popular with the majority, of course, not not among the the large Muslim uh, population, and maybe those who would like to see less of this hyper-nationalism. As you know, I, I was there for about six months. Two years ago, I came back from uh, having spent the fall semester there. I was a Fulbright scholar. And, you know, I began to see a lot of examples of this nationalism. For example, now when you go to any movie theater in India, it always starts with the national anthem and everybody is required to stand up. Uh, and I used to do that at the beginning. And then at some point I just got tired of it. It's like, well, this is not my national anthem. I don't have to do this. Uh, it was my own kind of little protest at the movie theater. <laughs> but, but after going to so many movies there, you know, I began to sing the song and I got to know the national anthem quite well. But th that was just a funny example in which, you know, that didn't happen before. But it's a way of trying to, I don't know, I guess, promote a, a certain sense of national pride. Uh, but it's more when you see these policies that are explicitly anti-Muslim, that begins to get a little more, uh, well, discriminatory and, 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 well, maybe not racist, but certainly, you know, targeting this. And, and it goes against really the ideals of India. When it was founded in 1947, you know, Nehru and, uh, uh, and Mahatma Gandhi, all the top leaders, very much fostered a secular, you know, uh, tolerance, uh, uh, you know, inviting all the major groups, uh, particularly, again, the large Muslim community. As you know, the story there, the, the split... The split that occurred in 47 uh, between Pakistan and India, of course, led to massive, massive migration of, of you know Muslims out of India to Pakistan, and then Hindus from Pakistan into, and and that migration resulted in millions being killed. It was a it was a horrific experience, uh, and those tensions have remained ever since uh, since 1947, the creation. Uh, but I go back to this. I think you know in the early days, the the leaders, the founders of, of modern India, very much sought to create a secular. Um, society, let's say. I mean, uh, multi, multi religious, I guess. And now, what we've seen under Modi these last five, six years is very aggressive, uh, you know, Hindu nationalism, uh, the party that he comes from. Uh, very well, much it sounds like that. there's a dynamic that Modi, since what is he, two years in office now? Uh, no, no, more than that. Uh, at least four or five by now. He's been reelected already. Even time once. flies. Yeah. So Definitely, he's yeah. changed, right? There's a dynamic going on with him. Could you articulate yeah. how that's working? Well, if anything, I think now he, he's gotten more confident. He's been able to push more aggressively on some of that. It's always been there. He's always been a very strong, you know, nationalist, uh, Hindu, Hindu nationalist, we, we would say. Um, and But, uh, you know, he is very much uh, solidly in control. His party, the BJP party, has a very, you know, very much control. And so um, I guess I want to say he does have popular support. He's not unpopular. And, and it's not quite the polarized society that we might see in the U.S. or in many other countries that is divided down the middle. Uh, it is basically this small but significant minority of Muslims who are, uh, let's say, the ones that are, the, uh, I guess, the targets of many of his uh, policies. So, All that yeah, considered, Carlos, it, it sounds like he's a perfect uh, object of affection for Trump. Um, yes, and yes, that's absolutely. part of what motivated, uh, maybe a large part of what motivated Trump's uh, trip over there. But you know, yeah. one thing that strikes me, and this is the, you know, the second subject for us, to discuss is that Trump made that trip at a time when we all um, became increasingly concerned about coronavirus. Um, yes, yes, and when we would have expected the leader of the free world to stay in the White House and work on it, uh, he was off trundling into this uh, love affair in India. <clears throat> and, I, and I wonder, um, you know, I wonder whether Trump could have done a better job. We, we saw him a day or two ago uh, uh, making a you know, a statement of policy about what he was going to do and who was going to do what to deal with coronavirus. What do you think about that? How well has he done so far? Well, again, it's a mixed bag. He obviously has sent conflicting signals from what his healthcare professionals have done. Uh, uh, by and large, uh, you know, the, the public health community is, is very clear, including the CDC, saying, look, this situation is serious and it's likely to get worse before it gets better. And we do need to, you know, be aware of it and be observant. And I think, you know, Trump was, 
like any leader trying to maybe allay concerns and when he sees the stock market as it has been you know tanking these last few days uh continuing to do so um i think you know some would maybe critics would say he's more interested in that aspect since his re-election uh, depends on very much uh, an argument that he's made the economy strong and, and should that change obviously that begins to erode that but uh if you saw the press conference he held yesterday it was a little you know he was again uh, as typical you know boasting about things that had nothing to do with the issues there, uh, putting blame on the media and the Democrats when this is a time when, you know, the leader should come forward and just reassure the population, make sure we, we are confident that they're doing the best they can. Um, he has appointed as his czar, of course, Vice President Mike Pence, and that itself has raised some, some you know, concerns and puzzles given that he named him because he had experience as governor of Indiana, and yet uh, the story in Indiana is one that has raised questions about the Trump, I'm sorry, uh, Pence's own either capacity or uh, maybe how powerful his own religious views and values are in dealing with something that requires clearly scientific, rational, you know, uh, careful public policy and not, you know, faith and, 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 and somehow prayer. I mean, well, there was a piece about how uh, at the time of this outbreak of HIV, I think it was, while uh, mm -hmm. Pence was yes. the governor of Indiana. Um, he addressed that by turning to prayer, uh, which yeah, I don't yeah. think qualifies him to deal with a, a global a global epidemic, a pandemic like this one, which is only going to be resolved by science. Yeah, I was a little surprised. I mean, on one hand, I think it's the, the Health and Human Services Secretary, uh, Asnar. I mean, he he's head of the task force and seems a logical choice. But uh, often, as we've seen over the years here in the U.S., we like to have a czar, somebody who's, you know, given this title of, you know, whether it's the the drugs are for many years now it's the the, you know, the, the COVID or the coronavirus are um you know in the end uh, obviously it's all about coordinating the many different pieces and it's you know both the the public health the cdc but also you know state uh, relations with different states uh you know law enforcement uh you know logistics transportation uh so there there is a critical need for for this uh, coordinating role but also a crisis communication. You need to be able to manage, uh, you know, the media in a way that reassures people, provides good information, not mixed signals. And I think, you know, the last few days we've seen some of the mixed signals that have left many questioning, you know, both his knowledge, because literally he, he, he did not know, for example, the, the very large number of deaths that occur every year from the influenza, from flu. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, we, we, we have the ritual every year, the flu, get your flu shots. Why? Well, many people don't realize that, but literally every year, I, I think I've seen figures 15 to 60,000 Americans die of the flu every year. So that's, uh, you know, a reality. But uh, here we're dealing now with an issue that takes on a, you know, both a global dimension because of this, you know, and, and then a lot of questions and uncertainty still. We don't know a lot um, about uh, exactly how it's being transmitted. I mean, I can't speak to some of those technical issues, you know, I'm not uh, able to, uh, but what I'm reading and hearing is that, yeah, this is something that by most measures, we, we now have just a few days ago for the first time, we've had more new reported cases uh, outside of China and it's spreading uh, wildly, uh, you know, even here, I think we had the uh, first one in the US and California, uh, just yesterday, day before yesterday, the first in Latin America and Brazil, uh, many uh, European countries beginning to feel it. Northern Italy is now coming under quite a bit of uh, uh, tension and, and, and many of the cases in Europe are connected to people who have been traveling there, uh, whether on ski or, you know, ski you know, uh, uh, trips or otherwise uh, in this region around Milan, where uh, what I'm reading too is that there's just a lot of places that are suddenly being like clamped down. Um, it's centered primarily in Northern Italy, but uh, you know this is this is a concern. Let, let's uh, assume and, let's assume that it continues that way. Well, I mean, I think we have every reason to assume that it will continue that way. There are more cases across more borders, more borders being shut down, more quarantines, uh, more governmental action, maybe sometimes overly drastic, as in China. Um, mm -hmm. And and you know, of course, you get uh, economic implications both on a, on a one nation at a time level and on a region level and on, on a global level. So my question to you, this is, this is really something to look forward or look ahead about, um, is, is this is ultimately going to have an effect on, on diplomatic foreign policy, geopolitical implications, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to, when you close borders, when you say people can't travel, uh, when you have, um, you know, uh, uh, syncopated, 
uh, failures in, in local and global economy. Um, that's got to affect geopolitics. It's got to put some no. people higher, some people lower. Uh, it's got to mm -hmm. it's got to test our ability to, to stay peaceful and calm. What do you think is going to mm -hmm. happen in that regard? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I mean, right now it's interesting to see how it has been primarily, at least up until now, places like South Korea and many of the European countries. Uh, we have not seen it quite yet uh, maybe take on a, a significant presence in, let's say, Africa, the African continent, or even much of Latin America. Again, there was a single case in Brazil, and I think it was somebody connected to Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I mentioned that because developing countries in, in places like Africa or even maybe some parts of Latin America are going to be challenged with the, you know, the maybe weaker infrastructure or capacity. And yet the other is that if it is something that is involved with traveling, uh, that's how it's going to spread. But I go back to Africa. This is a place where China itself is deeply, deeply, you know, embedded throughout many of the African countries uh, doing a lot of, uh, you know, infrastructure development and, and, and uh, construction and whatnot. Uh, and yet what we've also seen, I think what, what's been taking place and I mean, getting to your main question, I think as certain countries are beginning to limit restriction of travel to or from places, I think I just saw a while ago that Japan has taken a very aggressive move now to, if I'm not mistaken, I think they're canceling uh, schools uh, in the Yes, I saw country. that too this morning. Yes, yeah. they're, they're closing all the schools them, in Japan. They, they are taking, a, I think, a preemptive action given that the uh, upcoming Summer Olympics are going to be there. They want to try not to, uh, you know, uh, they, I guess they want to try to, make sure that they can get a handle on it before it becomes a, a crisis and you know a society like japan very well organized very you know uh, capable of, of of doing that let's say but maybe not in the harsh authoritarian way we're seeing in in, in china but you know I, I guess i haven't thought too much about it but the the, the impact on geopolitics i'm not sure uh, clearly the other angle though which is going to be the global you know the interdependence of the global economy uh, china is already beginning to see a real effect on its uh, output and given you know the very deep uh, interconnection of supply chain networks you know it's going to affect people everywhere uh, in the u.s uh, you know getting access to manufactured goods uh, uh, even you know something as simple as these masks that apparently are now running out uh, they of course like everything are made in china but other places have to probably fill in that gap now uh, so I, I think the real concern is going to be more the economic impact that it's going to have um, i guess I'm not quite sure because uh, part of me wants to say that like Europe very much has a strong, let's say, culture and tradition of coordination and cooperation and through the EU and then individual countries very much are, are all deeply, well, uh, in sync. And, and, and so right now the focus is on Italy because that's where the cases have, you know, 650 cases, I think 817 deaths. But I was reading uh, details where in France they're anticipating it's likely to dribble in there very soon. So they too are kind of trying to take some preemptive measures. We've had some single cases, I think, in Denmark and uh, maybe Latvia was another one. Oh, my goodness. Each of these, you know, they're, they're aggressively trying to find out if, uh, if it's where, you know, if there any way to, it's connected to, you know, Italy or China or what. And, you know, this is the real challenge because it's moving so quickly every day. And, uh, you know, what we're hearing from some of the experts, I, I heard uh, one of the former CDC heads, uh, I think uh, Tom Friedman, uh, in an interview day before yesterday, making very clear this is likely to get worse before it gets better, and yeah. uh, and that's you know that's that's not a, I mean it's a, it's an important message to let people know because you, you you should not be I think as we heard from President Trump oh no we got a handle on it it's okay it's not going to affect us that's a little uh, deceiving and, and not being uh, honest. You and know, Carlos, this is, Trump... is a related issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned it earlier in connection with Trump's uh, speeches, his press release, his rambling. Yeah. Every press release, pre press conference is rambling. Uh, and you mentioned it in terms of managing information so as yeah, not yeah. to get people you know, too excited, mm -hmm. uh, to yeah. avoid panic. And so uh, every leader, every government's going to be mindful of that and going to you know, yeah. sort of calculate comments and, and public statements, not not to panic people. Uh, in yeah. the case of Trump, you know, I don't think he knows how to do that. Uh, and he, no, no, he makes it, his I mean, own decisions. Now, one of the, it, it, one of the things crisis, he said is... Crisis communication, if, right? Say again? In other, I was just saying it's crisis communication. You need to know how to handle an emergency yeah. situation like this. And, and it means, you know, clear and, and not you know, wandering off and, you know, and rambling about, you know, your opponents or criticizing the press. I mean, that's not the point. The point and is telling that, the truth. You know, give, 
Yes. He has and a terrible, a terrible sure. reputation for not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And so how can and, you rely and I, in no. crisis on his statements when you, you question whether he's telling the truth? One of the remarkable mm -hmm. things he said was, uh, don't worry, this is out of uh, being there with Peter Sellers, don't worry, in the springtime, everything will be better, it'll be warmer, and, and that will diminish the effect of the virus. That's not, there's no evidence of that. Um, yeah. and, and so I think what we're going to get from him are untruths, as usual, and uh, that's not going to help allay the panic. Now, let me shift for a minute to, to China, where mm -hmm. Xi Jinping is also very interested in avoiding panic. And he's taking, mm -hmm. you know, draconian steps to do that. And anyone, mm -hmm. who, anyone who makes a public statement about the failure of the government to deal properly with this or about, um, you know, how, how bad it might be, uh, is going to be arrested uh, and muzzled and probably taken away to a dark place. And that, in fact, that's happening. And the, and the underground Chinese media is filled with stories about people who have been taken away from their homes because they made statements uh, against the effect, against, the, against Xi Jinping and, and his efforts to um, you know, deal with the virus. So I think what happens here is in trying to deal um, you know, to avoid panic, trying to deal with it on informational crisis management, uh, governments change and do very yeah. strange things, and it feeds right into a, you know, a, 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 a very over, overbearing government, a dictatorial government, uh, yeah. as in the case of China. And don't you think that over time, uh, when the panic gets worse, when the situation gets worse, the press will be under attack, as it already is with, with him, yeah. uh, and that anyone who speaks against you know, the government in any country uh, will be at risk. Yeah. And, and you know, again, it, it is very important in these complex emergencies uh, where, you know, you've got to get a handle on that because otherwise, you know, you can. And unfortunately, Trump is starting already from a disadvantage because, you know, half the population just doesn't believe him. And, 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 and as you noted, when he does have any kind of statements, he is not very good at just reading what you're supposed to. He ends up wandering off and saying things and, and drifting into, you know, things that are not the core focus that you need to deal with. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, and, and we, you know, you can say throughout history or at least, you know, modern history, whenever you have these emergencies, it could be an earthquake, a natural disaster, often they become a very powerful political uh, challenge for the leadership. It can erode their credibility, legitimacy uh, in different ways and, uh, you know, how they handle it. I mean, whether, you know, you recall Katrina and, you know, comments that George W. Bush and how he handled it. Um, and you'd think by now that, you know, governments, it's, it's one of the things you have to do. You've got to be able to respond quickly, clearly, good information, you know, competent people. Frankly, some, you know, again, Trump doesn't have anybody there to tell him this, but somebody else should be in charge of this, clearly. And Pence, well, you know, it doesn't command, I guess, a lot of, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, he doesn't Confidence. come across as being, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, just to, to, to be very clear. So, uh, you know, that's unfortunate. But who else is he going to convince? He's going to have to buy somebody because even, you know, uh, even the public health officials, they want to be, as they are as scientists, very clear. And, and, and you know, and, and uh, then I think there was, uh, just to add again to the, all the politics of this, I think one of the top leaders of the Centers for Disease Control um, involving infectious diseases uh, happens to be the sister of Rod Rodenstein, uh, uh, this uh, you sure. know, recent acting attorney general, and, and she was giving statements of you know cautioning, warning, and suddenly now uh, a lot of the right wing, uh, you know, <laughs> alt media, whatever, alt right is is now like up in arms. It's all a conspiracy. It's the dark state. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite no. one. He he agrees no. uh, that there's a conspiracy of uh, the Democrats and that the coronavirus yes. is a democratic weapon. Uh, only exactly. meant to bring him down. The absurdity of the, the insanity of that is, is inescapable. Mm -hmm. But let me let me yes. ask you this: You're a traveler, and you go on these Fulbright mm -hmm. trips. You're always doing that. You're you think globally, you act globally, you travel globally. You're everywhere. There are yes. no barriers for you, Carlos, and I admire no, you very no. greatly for that. So here you are on the cusp of a lot of travel. In fact, you're traveling right now. Yes. And that means right. getting morning, on a plane. Yes. It means dealing with crowds. Mm -hmm. It means yes. hearing the person in the seat next to you cough and retch or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. how, yes. how are you changing your technique? How are you protecting yourself? How will you protect yeah. yourself in the future? 
I know. And, and it's a tough one because anybody who's got some uh, travel plans have to really think carefully about it. It's not always easy to cancel. Usually when you buy, you know, most people don't buy their cancellation insurance policy options. And, you know, you've got to make a tough decision. Uh, this morning I did. I left Mexico City. I got on a plane to San Antonio. And you could already see a lot of the um, airport workers are very much covered in masks, understandably. Uh, but I was actually in line coming into my plane and, and, and a woman behind me from China, although coming from Mexico to Texas, eventually on her way to China, uh, but she was uh, right next to me and began coughing and sneezing. And I, I have to admit, I was a bit nervous. I tried to you know, walk away. I think more immediately, and, and the advice we're getting from, you know, obviously the experts, you've got to continually wash your hands as often as possible. You know, the mask can be helpful, but you gotta have the right kind of mask. A lot of these uh, that are out there are not. Um, but the other is uh, also avoid trying to like touch yourself because uh, in public areas that, where you could have exposure, uh, it might be on a tabletop or on a counter or some knob and then suddenly you start touching your nose or your mouth, your eyes and that's going to bring it into you. So you've got to begin uh, to, and as I took this initiative myself today, trying to be real careful. Literally every bathroom I saw, I would go in and wash my hands again. Um, and uh, that's the uh, best we can do now. Beyond that, I have to think carefully. In, a, in, a, in about a month, I'll be on my way to Europe there. And I'm, as you know, I travel every year to Innsbruck and Austria, just a stone's throw from Northern Italy. And now I'm having to, you know, I'm hoping they can contain it and, and solve it. But even as I am likely to go, I don't plan to cancel a trip. I'm going to probably be very low key. I do some lectures there. So I'm just going to avoid big crowded places and, and, and you know minimize being in places where and yet, again, Innsbruck is a place where tourists are always coming there, busloads of Chinese tourists. Over the years I've been going there now, 12 years, I've seen an interesting changing dynamics of the tourism. And, and China and also India are now the, among the most popular tourists. They go to this alpine region, you know, to basically enjoy the beauty of it. Um, and they often come just for the day, busloads of them. Uh, but uh, yeah, now uh, I wonder to what extent it might be affecting that region, given, again, the proximity of northern Italy. It's right there. Yeah. Stone's it's really a away. flat world these days. Yeah. Well, Carlos, no, there, no, is, and... there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, um, when you travel, uh, or when anyone travels, or when we want to reach somebody in a faraway place, name it anywhere in the world, we can mm -hmm. do it by vmix, uh, vmix call remote. <laughs> which is what we're using right now. So when, when you go to Europe, we can catch you there and you can talk to us that's right. and we will have no fear and you will have no fear. And that, that's a blessing. <laughs> yes. yes, but but we do, you have to think carefully about it. And, uh, and, and until we get a very better sense that this has gotten under control, for now, it looks like uh, we're literally gonna have to be, you know, staying abreast of developments, what's happening and, and how our officials dealing with it. Uh, and no doubt, I mean, given just the, you know, we are same humans everywhere, but in fact, we are different in, in, in the how certain cultures you, you describe, for example, the Chinese, given their uh, form of government and the political culture, uh, very much uh, the leadership there is moving aggressively to kind of snuff out any criticism, of course, because it can cost them. It can become a crisis of legitimacy, uh, a challenge to their, you know, their not so democratic rule. Uh, so while it is going to impact the economy of many places, including China, which which will affect the entire world. Uh, it is also this, I don't know, just this fear and paranoia and, and, and you know, anxiety that can lead to other things. You know, people get We don't nervous, know uh, all the things that are going to change around us. Indeed, as I mentioned no. at the at the inception, we are in a transformation happening yeah. right now. And, thank and, you, and, you know, for, for you. We're Thank out of you. Time. No, no, I, was just, I, was, I wanted to say that this is the reality we're going to see in the future. Pandemics and, and diseases, uh, they are going to be with us. Uh, this is just one now, and, and there will be others in the future. So we're going to have to come to terms with this. Okay, but you you know, after this call, you you, you don't actually have to wash your hands. Thank, th okay. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos Suarez. I hope we talk Thank to you. you. I know we'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks, and I certainly yes, appreciate course. the show. Global Connections Great. with Carlos Suarez, wherever he is. Aloha. Hello.